All right. So uh, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And I am just delighted uh, to be here uh, with you to talk a little bit about uh, superhero science and uh, the next time you go to the movies. And but before we get into that conversation, so I am going to talk uh, quite a bit about a fictional element from Marvel Studios, uh, Vibranium. But I want to assure all of you that I really do investigate actual elements on the periodic table, real elements. And so this is a uh, proof of that. Uh, this is actually a paper that was published last year uh, in the Chemical Educator. It's a collaboration with uh, two of my former students where we were investigating five different uh, transition metal complexes shown at the bottom here, uh, basically copper, gold, and, uh, and also rhenium, and evaluating them against lung cancer cell lines. And so one of, one of my students, Kyle Cohen, who was a double major in chemistry in France and is now a patent attorney living in New York, making all kinds of wonderful money. Um, he actually was lucky enough to grow X-ray quality crystals. And you know, you have to pray to the crystal gods to grow an X-ray quality crystal. And so the, the very first compound, as you can see, kind of has like a octahedral geometry around that central uh, metal ion. And it turns out, and these compounds are beautiful. They're like a, a purple violet uh, color, blue color. And it turns out that first compound actually exhibits modest, uh, modest behavior against lung cancer cell lines. But this is my proof that I do investigate real elements on the periodic table. And so for those of you who are unfamiliar uh, with Lawrence Technological University, so it's a small private institution uh, of about 2,500 to 3,000 students um, on the campus. Uh, uh, and, and it's a small private college in, in Michigan. And you know, today the, you know, the acronym STEM is essentially a buzzword, but it's deeply embedded in the DNA of Lawrence Tech when it was established back in 1932, adjacent to Henry Ford's Model T factory. So once we're past this pandemic and we're gonna get through it, if you are ever visiting Michigan, you have an open invitation to come hang out with me on the campus of Lawrence Tech um, in the Marburger STEM Center. So for our conversation uh, today, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit, I have a few slides about the Marburger STEM Center, and then we'll have a conversation about pop culture and kind of the second half of the talk focusing on storytelling uh, and diversity, equity, uh, and inclusion in STEM education or particularly chemical education. So the Marburger STEM Center, you can think of it essentially kind of as the clearinghouse or the umbrella, if you will, of all of the STEM activities we have on our campus. So that includes our high school summer camps, uh, Extreme Science Saturdays, which is a program targeting middle school and high school students. We have a number of partnerships with several different uh, school districts and, and stakeholders in this STEM education uh, space. And so the STEM Center, you can think of it, basically we focus on, we have three key focus areas, right? So that first is supporting current LTU faculty, students and staff. Second is that public engagement piece, which I'm gonna uh, talk a little bit about and then industry connections. And because this is a very festive and uh, we're in the holiday season, what I'm showing on the screen here are LED based uh, snowflakes, which were created using a 3D printer uh, in, the, uh, in, in the STEM center. So STEM all day long throughout the holidays. And so our summer camps play a really important role here at Lawrence Tech. Uh, basically nearly, it's a high yielding program, nearly 50% of students that participate in these summer camps actually enroll at uh, LTU. Automotive engineering obviously is our most popular one because we're here in Michigan with the big three. Um, we also have molecules of medicine, starting your own business, that sort of thing. Um, and students have the opportunity to live in the college dorms or uh, they can actually have a commuter experience at our, and our summer camps are taught by our faculty, which is one of the reasons why I think they're, they're so popular and successful. 
And so we have a wonderful uh, uh, team uh, in the Marburg STEM Center. So we have an assistant director, Jay Jessen, but we wouldn't have any, we wouldn't be able to do anything without uh, having wonderful students. And so, which is why I'm also, I'm just thrilled to be talking with all of you. So we have uh, four ambassadors uh, as well, helping us uh, with incredible hands-on types of activities. A recent activity because we've finally been able to get back into uh, the schools and doing some in-person activities, actually focused on, uh, we visited two uh, local middle schools. And so basically it focused on uh, electric circuits, right? So using a, creating a paper LED circuit. And uh, basically the students were provided with kits with uh, a battery, uh, a template, conducting tape and an LED light with the whole purpose of creating this circuit to light up the LED. Uh, and basically what we did, because we like to have fun with these, you know, engaging the students about how cell phones work, asking them about popular apps on their phones and that, that sort of thing. So I asked the students, you know, what were their favorite apps? And many of them, of course, said YouTube and TikTok and those kinds of things. And when I said Facebook, they were all appalled and said Facebook is for old people. So I felt real small for, <laughs> for a minute, but nevertheless, we are, we're able to, we wanna have fun uh, with the students. And you know, pr prior to the pandemic, obviously we've had, to, be, before the pandemic, we were delivering workshops in person, but we've also delivered uh, virtually as well. One example of that is a virtual workshop focused on the science of baking with middle school students uh, who are doing some remote learning at home. So they were in the kitchens, baking cakes and cupcakes. And so having conversations with them about uh, the importance of monitoring your sugar intake and diabetes, you know, you wanna have a teachable moment. And one of the things that we've also done, uh, I had an opportunity to collaborate with a colleague, Dr. Sean Hitchcock, who teaches at Illinois State University. And we uh, collaborated to create a bonus, uh, a, a, an assignment for organic chemistry students where the students actually evaluated the chemical structure of one of the compounds being evaluated for treating the uh, coronavirus, uh, COVID-19. And so one thing is very clear, this pandemic that is impacting all of us is showing in real time why STEM education and why uh, chemistry actually matters. But what we also do is use movies like Black Panther to engage the next generation. So let me quickly give you the backstory on how we actually ended up uh, publishing this particular article. Um, because I can tell you prior to the film being released uh, in February of 2018, I was not a fan of Marvel Comics. I didn't read Marvel comic books and I really wasn't even planning to see the film, but my sister encouraged me to see it. So, and one of the things about me um, is that I cannot turn off my chemistry brain when I'm watching television or, uh, or uh, uh, at the movies. And so it occurs to me as I'm watching a film and I'm enjoying it, that this fictional African nation is thriving on the production and use of this element called vibranium. And I kept saying to myself as I watched the film, if this element were real, where would it be on the periodic table? I kid you not, that's what I kept thinking about. Uh, and that's what we chemists and physicists actually do. We come up with these questions that we think are interesting. To make a long story short, I go, I go home that night, start writing out what I think this paper should look like, send an email to my colleague, Professor Appleby, who teaches in the uh, Department of Natural Sciences. And I said, hey, have you seen this film? And can you ask this as a bonus question on your next general chemistry exam? And she did. And we found out immediately who the Marvel comic fans were in the department. And we used some of their responses uh, for the paper and submitted it uh, for publication in March of 2018, it was accepted and then published uh, online in June of 2018. And I'm not gonna go through all of, all of this, but this is the actual question uh, that was uh, given to the students. And, and the thing about it, the students were to obviously propose an elemental symbol, um, an electron configuration, oxidation states, and where they thought the element should actually fit. And there is no right or wrong answer. We were just trying to leverage the popularity of the movie to get the students to think about uh, um, how the periodic table is arranged. Um, and a majority of the students actually concluded 
that if the element did exist, it should fit with the transition metals where the D block is, or uh, at the bottom of the periodic table with the lanthanides and the actinides where the F block elements actually are. And I agree with that, but you can make an argument that the element could fit with the alkali metals or the alkaline earth metals. Now, once it was published, I shared it on, shared the link on social media. And to my surprise, it actually got a little bit of a attention. Um, and so I just want to share a couple of uh, posts that, I, that really, really caught my attention. This is probably my favorite. Forget Infinity War. This is the best crossover ever. And when I saw that, I was like, okay. So this is resonating with a lot of people. So for you guys who are watching, you know, don't be afraid to take a risk and, and share an idea because you never know how an idea will connect with other people. So this particular post really gets to the heart of what we were focusing on, really taking a holistic approach and thinking about the properties of, the, uh, of these elements, but also the film Black Panther provides an opportunity to have a, a national conversation We'll continue the conversation on the important contributions uh, for women and people of color in the STEM, di in STEM uh, disciplines. Because the character Shuri resonated with a lot of people um, and is in a particular a lot of young people and is a shining example of what's possible when everybody has an opportunity able to sit at the table and the lab bench. We had a faculty member in Brazil uh, tweet about us. So we have this international connection. And then it's always really awesome when your doctoral advisor, your PhD advisor gives you a shout out on Twitter and you haven't been in the lab breaking glassware. Uh, I broke a lot of glassware as a graduate student and I graduated over 20 years ago, but it's always nice you get that approval from your, from your PhD advisor. Now to my surprise, there was um, you know, a number of chemistry faculty um, started sharing on, on Twitter other ideas that I hadn't considered or concepts when I when we published this paper. For example, uh, what is the half-life of vibranium? So you're thinking about radioactive decay concepts or relativistic effects, right? Which explain the unusual behavior that we see in the heavier elements uh, like mercury being a metal, but it's liquid or material science. You know, So the point is you can design an entire curriculum um, around using a film as a hook, right, to, to, to spark some interest. So we were interviewed, uh, we were, our work was highlighted in Chemical and Engineering News, which is published by the American Chemical Society uh, for the news script section. We were interviewed by a journalist from Wired, uh, which obviously has a much more broad audience and, and readership. We were also given a shout out in Bloomberg Opinion. We were not interviewed for this article, but the author mentioned our work at the end, uh, stating how we were using the film to make connections to real science content. And this is certainly a highlight for me because I've never been connected to the Oscars at all in my career. So this was, this was pretty fun and exciting uh, once, that, once we found this article. Now, we also were interviewed by a journalist from uh, Scholastic Science World, which is read by middle school and high school kids. And what they did, which I think is really brilliant of them, so this is a screenshot of the actual article. Um, they actually, their team put together um, lesson plans aligned with the next generation science standards, which you may be familiar with. Uh, basically, these standards of you know, what students should learn uh, in, the, in, the, in the classroom. And they put together these lesson plans for students to classify vibranium. So I'm sharing a, a screenshot of a worksheet. And it occurred to us that we can use these materials uh, for, for workshops for high school and middle school students. So that's exactly what we did. So in February of 2019, we had about 35 high school students on our campus who worked in teams, they read the article, completed the worksheet, but then they worked together to develop a creative poster for a gallery walk. So in this classroom, we had these uh, posters, you know, throughout the, on the walls and each group presented. And it was so much fun. Um, what I love about this though, 
is that you always have students that have this wonderful artistic ability. They love to sketch and draw and those kinds of things. And so now you're talking about bridging uh, basically um, STEM and chemistry with art and the humanities. So this is one of the sketches that was on the poster and I just loved it. So with middle school students, so with these younger students, um, they were just as engaged, but you know, the, the thing about it, the younger students were really more concerned with how pretty the poster was, color schemes and all of that stuff. It was, a, I mean, they had some really spirited discussions and arguments over, uh, over cosmetic type stuff. But nevertheless, they were just as uh, engaged. And this is probably one of the best posters uh, that a team put together and I absolutely loved it. This is the second one as well. Just really creative. We also had, uh, to our surprise, a high school science teacher from Italy uh, email us. Um, and she sent us a link to her blog. Uh, and she's using this, uh, use the paper uh, to engage her students. So again, uh, that's that international connection and everybody seems to be connecting uh, with, with this work. Most recently, what I discovered is that there is a, a journal entitled Superhero Science and Technology. Um, and the editor is Dr. Barry Fitzgerald, who's a physicist, uh, and he's located in the Netherlands. And I've had a couple of Zoom conversations with him because I was really curious why he established this journal in the first place. And the idea for him is that he wanted uh, educators and students who love superhero movies and films and those kinds of things and television shows uh, to have a place to publish. Uh, so if you're interested in that kind of work, there is, a, uh, there is a journal out there specifically for that. And then for this particular issue, um, obviously it's celebrating the late uh, Chadwick Boseman uh, for his amazing portrayal of T'Challa and, and Black Panther. But Black Panther is not the only film that you can use. You can use other films too. So think about your favorite films or television shows and how you would use your background in, in chemistry or physics or, or whatever area um, to engage younger students and how you can bring that in to, to discuss concepts you're learning in class. So I love the movie Hidden Figures and I loved it so much. I was determined to come up with uh, um, a program uh, specifically for middle school students. And that's what we did in 2017. So we had students, teachers, and parents on campus for this summer camp uh, experience. And there were four different uh, uh, workshops. Uh, in a science workshop, the students learned about the science of things that fly. In math, they learned some fundamentals of, uh, of algebra. But the idea is to meet students where they are and get these younger students to understand how STEM shapes their everyday experiences. I love the uh, original, I'm a huge fan of the original first three Star Wars films. So Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi. And may she rest in peace. Carrie Fisher was just the most awesome, awesome uh, uh, princess. And to this very day, whenever I see her character kill Jabba the Hutt, I cheer because Jabba the Hutt was disgusting back then years ago and is still really nasty now. Um, Billy D. Williams, I have him on the slide for two reasons. For one, he's super handsome. I know that's terrible. Uh, but I was also thrilled uh, that he reprised his role in a more recent uh, uh, movie as part of the Star Wars uh, franchise. But again, the point is you can design an entire curriculum uh, around a, a, uh, a film as a hook. But here's the question. Does really adding science fiction, bringing it into the classroom, does that add really any uh, value? And this was a key question for a paper that was published by Dr. Randy Yarrick um, uh, back in 2017. And I'm not gonna go through the entire paper, obviously, but I just wanna highlight a couple of things. One of the things that uh, Yarrick and Simmons, what they stress, is that when you bring science fiction into the classroom, it allows students like yourselves to make these cultural connections with your uh, instructors and, and faculty members. Obviously there's increasing interest. And the other thing that they point out is that um, science majors are not the only ones that like science fiction films. Non-science majors, you know, people majoring in the humanities, they love science fiction films 
uh, as well. So you can now make these connections across content. But I come from the perspective, anytime you have STEM faculty and students and humanities faculty and students collaborating on projects together, amazing things can happen. And that's exactly what we did uh, um, back a few years ago, a couple of years ago, where we ended up publishing a paper drawing comparisons between Mary Shelley's novel, Frankenstein, and Marvel Studios' Black Panther. And so I, the thing is with back in 2018, which you may remember, uh, it was a 200 year anniversary of Mary Shelley's novel, which is a brilliant science fiction uh, novel. I absolutely love it. Um, and we had, uh, so basically we collaborated with a high school English teacher, Ms. Lori Lewis, who's shown at the top here with two of her students. And so basically um, she was teaching three sections of an English course uh, with 90 high school uh, students. And so they were basically required to read Frankenstein as an assignment. Um, and I had a chance to like read their essays, focus on if Frankenstein's creature were alive today, how would he be treated as society? Just brilliant. Um, but the students were on our campus for a seminar and uh, a faculty panel. And uh, one of the uh, panelists, Dr. Eric Meyer, who teaches in uh, biomedical engineering at Lawrence Tech, started talking about making connections, talking about the Avengers films. And the students were really uh, resonating and getting excited about that. So I, I followed up and asked the students if they thought the relationship between Frankenstein and his creature in a novel somehow was similar to Eric Killmonger and Black Panther in the film. And they said, oh yes, they were both abandoned by their communities and they had no choice but to fight their enemies and that sort of thing. So I had an aha moment. I said, okay, we need to publish this. And that's what we ended up doing. And so last, last year, I had the opportunity to publish a book chapter entitled Inorganic Chemistry, Vibranium and Marvel Studios Black Panther, uh, which was published in a new uh, book, uh, ACS Symposium Series, Advances in Teaching Inorganic Chemistry. And I'm just thrilled to be a part of this, uh, part of this book with all these amazing authors. And so basically I was absolutely devastated uh, and really sad to learn of his passing because he was so young at 43, passing away from, from colon cancer. But I wanted to dedicate my chapter to his memory for his amazing portrayal of uh, Black Panther. And what my chapter is about is really a summary of how we've used the film for, for engagement. Now for the second half of this talk, I wanna focus on um, using storytelling uh, in the classroom and, and for engagement, uh, uh, addressing equity. Because my research is really at the intersection of STEM education or chemical education and diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I use storytelling as a pedagogical tool to address uh, equity. And so a couple of years ago, uh, Johnny M. Winston, uh, actually published this paper focused on teaching science as a story. And so this is an image of the, uh, one of the figures in, the, in, this, in this paper, and it's actually a generic uh, narrative uh, structural or uh, storytelling arc, if you will, of basically, uh, you know, for what you need for a successful, uh, for, a, uh, for a story. And so at the base of this exposition, that's when you introduce the characters, places, uh, people, and, and that sort of thing. Then you have this rise in action to a peak, right, of a story, and eventually a conclusion. Um, and so you've probably seen this before in an English class or something like that. But he makes two points about uh, storytelling. One, he says that you can teach science as a story, right, teach science content as a story, or you can teach science using stories about science, um, such as history of science, which is what I do. And this is an example of a stoichiometry content story. And so the idea is for educators uh, to show uh, these kinds of frameworks so that students can see how content is connected to each other, such as, you know, so, um, you know, you, uh, the educator would need to show this obviously in class so the students could see it. But this is just an example of, you know, you can take any concept 
And you can do this yourself, you know, create a, uh, a content uh, story. So I want you to keep these, uh, these narrative structures in mind as I, uh, throughout the remainder of this talk. So last year, um, uh, you know, well, for the first time in my career, I had the opportunity to serve as editor of a new book uh, entitled African American Chemists, Academia, Industry, and Social Entrepreneurship. Um, and let me give you the backstory on how I actually ended up becoming editor uh, of this particular book. So last year, June of 2020, I received an email from an editor uh, at ACS and really asking, we wanted, they wanted to have a conversation about my interest in being involved in this project. And so last year at this time, well, last summer, so we were having protests all over the country and also globally uh, regarding police brutality. Um, we were battling COVID, which we still are. And the numbers are, I think the state of Michigan, we're leading the nation right now uh, with rising COVID cases. And my hometown of Detroit, Michigan was getting hit especially hard. So I say all of that because there was just a lot going on at the time uh, in the country. Um, and I really didn't think I had the bandwidth to take on this responsibility, but nevertheless I did. And I, I, I'm glad that I served as editor and it's more than just a history book. So we provide uh, strategies for broadening the image of chemists uh, in the classroom. And at the end of each chapter are lesson plans or learning objects that educators can actually use uh, in the classroom. And the image that you see on the, uh, on the, on the book cover was uh, created by a LTU graduate, Matt Campbell, in architecture and design. And so he was inspired by Spider-Man and, and Black Panther uh, when he designed this. And so to me, it's really a sky bridge leading to a state-of-the-art facility that makes vibranium for the entire world. We're in a Marvel universe, right? So we can do whatever we want. But the lesson plans at the end of each chapter was actually inspired uh, by my uh, involvement with uh, something called the Virtual Inorganic Pedagogical Electronic Resource. It's called Viper and it's free. And uh, basically it is for faculty, but students can actually, I think, utilize this source as well. And so there are a number, a number of lesson plans called learning objects on this site. And so one of my favorite learning objects focused on generating ligand group orbitals or constructing molecular orbital diagrams. And I know that's a favorite topic of all of you, uh, molecular or orbital diagrams. <clears throat> and it was uh, actually, uh, this was actually authored by uh, Adam Johnson, a colleague of mine. So he published this article in Chemical and Engineering News where he talks about this approach. And so I was inspired by his work. And so for my lesson plan that you see in one of the, in at the end of one of the chapters uh, focuses on that. So if you remember from my paper that I shared at the beginning, so there was a copper, one of the copper uh, compounds, uh, which I have sketched here. And if you use these atomic orbitals in that X, Z plane, um, as generator functions, you should end up with uh, basically ligand group orbitals that look something like this. Now, if you're not familiar with this, that's okay. You can take more advanced courses in chemistry and learn about point groups and, and symmetry. But this is a real fun way, I think an intuitive way uh, to uh, think about bonding in these, in these compounds. And so basically I have connections to all of the contributing authors. Uh, in this particular book, uh, for example, Professor Lavetta Appleby, my colleague who actually uh, co-authored uh, the Black Panther paper, she tells her story uh, as well. So I have a lot of uh, connections. And I wanna tell you a little bit about Dr. Betty Washington Green, uh, as well as uh, Dag Abeva, who's actually a physicist uh, as well. And he gave a wonderful, all of them uh, provided uh, amazing chapters, but I'm just gonna highlight a couple in the interest of time. So I had a chance to interview uh, Dr. Betty Washington Green's daughter, Willetta Green Johnson, uh, for, uh, for uh, the chapter that I authored. And so she was from Texas, earned her undergraduate degree from Tuskegee University 
1955, and Tuskegee is a historically black college and university uh, in Alabama here. She earned her PhD in 1965 from Wayne State University. Um, and that was a huge uh, achievement because it was not that many African-American women who had earned PhDs in, a, in chemistry during that time period. So she worked at Dow Chemical uh, for 25 years in Midland, Mich Midland, Michigan, and she published several peer review publications and patents. And what you all know is that this is really important because publications, that's the currency of science, right? We have to be able to communicate, um, uh, share our work. You know, what good is an experiment if we can't tell anybody about it, right? But what I thought was really fascinating was her uh, legacy, family legacy in STEM, and her daughter, uh, Willetta, actually earned her PhD in physics from the University of Chicago. And I think it's pretty rare that you have a mother, daughter, mother and daughter that both earn a PhD in a STEM field, let alone chemistry and physics. Uh, but her daughter is a songwriter, a Grammy Award winner, um, and she's teaching uh, in Chicago. And so within that chapter, I do discuss the small numbers of African-American women that earn uh, PhDs in chemistry. And between 1948, when Dr. Marie Maynard Daly, uh, she became the first to earn a PhD in chemistry, um, and Dr. Harris in 1975, there were 11. So there may be one or two others, but I don't think so. The point is, is that it's a really, really small number during that time period when she earned her PhD. Now, Mr. Dag Abeba is actually a, uh, a physicist and he's a filmmaker. Uh, he's a native of Ethiopia, grew up in Virginia, earned his undergraduate degree in physics, and then later his master's degree in film and TV production from uh, uh, University of Cal Southern California. Um, and while he was working on his master's degree, he received a grant from the Sloan Foundation uh, to uh, write, produce, and direct his first narrative film uh, entitled The Ball Method. And it's about the career of Alice Augusta Ball. And if you're not familiar with her, uh, she uh, basically uh, was born in Seattle in like 1892, earned uh, two undergraduate degrees in chemistry and pharmacy from the University of Washington in 1912 and 1914, and then uh, eventually earned her uh, master's degree in 1915 from the College of Hawaii. And she also, I uh, co-authored a paper in the Journal of the American Chemical Society in 1914, which is highly unusual for a woman to do that during that time period, let alone an African-American woman. Uh, so she did all of that, those remarkable achievements. But what she really, what I think is really most important is she developed the first viable treatment for leprosy in the early 20th century, which was a serious public health crisis uh, during uh, her time. Um, and that, so leprosy is, it, it's a contagious, very painful, uh, debilitating disease that leads to damage of fingers and toes and often leads to uh, amputation. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, Dag, uh, Mr. Beba, he co-founded a uh, film uh, production uh, company. And for you, for you guys on the call, the students, I want you to think, you know, out the box with your careers. You know, you don't have to work in a lab for the rest of your life. If you're interested in telling stories, you can be a filmmaker. Use your background as a chemist uh, to tell stories and, and really impact society. And so I took a step back and actually uh, had a chance to kind of sketch uh, a narrative framework for how I would bring Alice, Alice's story into the classroom. I'm not gonna go, go over all of this, but obviously you would begin with a discussion of what leprosy is, and that history. Uh, and it was actually in the 14th century that uh, uh, residents from China were using uh, something called chalmugra oil to uh, treat uh, leprosy. Um, but basically it wasn't until so uh, several years later that Alice Augusta Ball, she isolated the active ingredients uh, in that oil and it was used uh, uh, developing, she created this first viable treatment and it was used well into the 1940s, but she died very young, never saw the impact of her work and her, and her research ideas were stolen. Uh, but University of, of Hawaii did acknowledge her uh, back in uh, uh, 2000. And so as the editor of the book, I had the opportunity 
uh, to obviously read everybody's chapter and look for connecting themes and obviously effective mentoring and chemistry identity, those were pretty common. But the book really fo focuses on one key question. How do we address equity in the STEM classroom? And there is no one way to answer that question. So obviously some strategies are storytelling, which you know uh, is, is my approach. But for, for you guys on the call, you know, storytelling really enhances important skills that employers are looking for, that communication skills, critical thinking, creativity, and innovation. So creativity obviously is about generating new ideas. Critical thinking is about evaluating those ideas. Um, so keep that in mind. Obviously, seminar invitations virtually, you know, is, is another strategy, using lesson plans within a book and narrative films. So in January of this year, I had the opportunity to publish an, an op-ed, uh, Nature Chemistry, entitled The Importance of Storytelling in Chemical Education, where I talk about Alice Ball's story, uh, Dr. Percy Julie, and it did also uh, an inspiration for me, uh, inorganic chemist, Dr. Greg Robinson. And so he's a native from Alabama, earned his undergraduate degree from Jacksonville State, and his PhD from University of Alabama, spent his entire career in academia, first at Clemson, now at University of Georgia. And he has way too many accolades for me to mention, but his most recent uh, is being elected to the National Academy of Sciences, which is a really big deal. Um, it's not that many people that get elected to the National Academy of Sciences, let alone people of color. He has over 150 papers published in Nature Chemistry, the Journal of the American Chemical Society, uh, you name it, he's published. But I first learned about him uh, when I was a graduate student in the late 1990s at Ohio State. And he was, he was synthesizing and characterizing these um, unusual compounds, particularly at that time, the gal line and ferro gal line. And when he published these two papers, <laughs> he, it, his ideas were not widely accepted by the chemistry community. And it played out in chemical and engineering news. And so I'm showing a screenshot of the article. So basically he was proposing, he and his colleagues were proposing that there was a triple bond between the central metal atoms, you know, and a lot of people, some people were disputing that. Uh, but for me, I, I looked at it this way. Here was somebody challenging our thinking about the nature of a chemical bond. And I actually just thought that was brilliant. And it impacted me so much. I later developed a lesson plan, which I brought into the classroom to tell his story. So again, bringing storytelling into the, uh, into the classroom. And I recently took a step back and actually created a narrative framework. Um, and you can do, again, you can do these kinds of things as well uh, to bring his story uh, into the classroom. And at the top is the structure of one of the compounds uh, from, his, from his work where there's a triple bond between the iron and, and gallium uh, metal centers. And so finally, you know, I also have uh, had the pr privilege of working with an amazing uh, student, Maria Antores Lopez, who in 2019, she graduated from Lawrence Tech with a degree in media communications. She actually wrote, directed, and produced a narrative film, a 30 minute narrative film entitled Women Untold, which is on YouTube. Um, based on three of my published articles, including telling the story of Alice Augusta Ball, uh, Dr. Jill Plummer Cobb, who was a biologist and later became president of a research intensive university, and Dr. Evelyn Boyd Granville, who's a mathematician who actually carried out calculations for three NASA space projects. So in closing, what I hope you take from this presentation is that I personally will believe that inclusion of science fiction and pop culture is valuable uh, for chemical education and STEM education and storytelling is important for, um, I think for chemistry, physics, biology, for all disciplines. And diversity, equity, and inclusion, it is good for business. It's not just the right thing to do. Research is clear that when you have more creative uh, research teams, innovation, you have an increase in innovation and in creativity. And with that, I will close. And thank you so much for listening. And I'll entertain any questions that you have at this time. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Collins. I'm sure we'll all agree that that was an incredibly engaging talk, um, and especially the focus on equity. Um, it's such an important thing to talk about. So thank you so much. Thank um, you. So yeah, does anyone have any questions in the chat or you can unmute? Oh, I see. A, there's a yeah. question here. Is it pronounced Khan? Uh, yeah, so I think Khan asks, uh, what do you think could be done to get more lecturers and teachers to start adopting these kind of populist storytelling teaching methods? Now, that's a great question. And one of the things that I've done recently, so back in September, I gave, uh, I led, I facilitated a workshop specifically for educators and offering them tools and tips on how they can bring storytelling into the classroom. So it's a 75 minute workshop. And it basically, you know, 20 minutes of that time allowed the educators, the workshop participants to start developing their own ideas for storytelling, what stories they would bring into the classroom. And the thing about it with, with the storytelling, you want to bring in stories that align with content that you're actually teaching, right? So you don't, I mean, it's okay uh, to have uh, specifically, you know, to have uh, short stories that you tell throughout, but uh, it's more impactful when you're bringing in stories that actually are aligned with what you're actually doing uh, in the classroom. So that's a great question, Khan. So I am starting to facilitate workshops and figuring out um, ways that I can share with the faculty my approaches for, uh, for storytelling in the classroom. Great, thank you so much. So any other questions? I had a question. How many of you are, are fans of Marvel uh, comics? And do you think it's a great idea to, to bring these kinds of, to use these films to engage, uh, to engage students in the classroom? Yeah, I'm a fan. <laughs> And I think, I think it is a really good idea because I do, I do feel like it's very, it can bring, like those kind of films can bring a lot of people together no matter what kind of bias they might have about certain ideas. So I think, yeah, I, I like it. Uh, Claire, that's, that's a great point. And you know what, there are, um, there's a lot of bad science <laughs> in these films. And I actually think it's having a bad science in the films it's not a bad thing because it allows us to talk about what's real, right? And uh, to correct some things. And that allows you to, uh, I think, make uh, some even more important connections to, to real science. So great points. Okay, so I see in the chat here, it's, is it Iman? Yeah. Yes, yes, Dr. Sabrina. Yes, ma'am. So yes. you said, go ahead with your question. Um, my question is, it's so difficult to just match between science and any kind of art. So how could we inspire the students to create scenarios? Um, they especially, uh, the, the English or the language, it's not the, the mother tongue, it's their, uh, the second language for them. And they used to, to use a scenario or form a stories in English and based on real life, not facts like science. And when they, uh, I started to um, in, in just uh, invite them to create scenario related to science, I found them, they repeated the facts. So for example, um, I tried to give them uh, one lesson for in the periodic table and ask them, ask them to create like um, one scene in a, stat, um, in a story and this scene um, is based on sequence on events. Uh, I, I checked the response to this assignment. Uh, I found that they repeated the same facts and there is no structure for the story. There is no problem and the, the, there is no narrator. 
So they don't use the building, the correct building for a story uh, in science. They just um, create like sentence and um, they don't ha have the ability uh, to create the correct scenario or the basic structure or the settings of the story. No, that's, I think so, that is a great, great question um, that you know, comments that you're bringing up. And the thing, one of the things that um, uh, I did in a course that I taught uh, back in the spring. So the final project for, uh, for this, it was a social seminar class uh, focused on science, gender, and race. And the final project or final exam, the students had to write, direct, and produce their own uh, five-minute documentary using their cell phones. Um, and so your point about you know, uh, students not understanding clearly how to construct a story or what goes into that, one of the things that I, that I did to help them, because that's a very valid point, uh, is I, I had Marie uh, Ann Torres Lopez, who uh, uh, wrote, directed, and produced that narrative film I mentioned, talk to the students uh, about uh, offering tools and tips and strategies on putting together a five-minute documentary. And I also shared examples of documentaries because when I mentioned to my students, hey, you're gonna create this five-minute documentary as your final project, they were very nervous about it. And I, did, I, I thought they would be excited. But what it was is that they weren't really sure uh, how to go about doing it. And so once I shared some brief films with them, they felt better. Now to think about it, what, what happens is they have to sit down and think about what story they're gonna tell in five minutes, right? So then to your point, they have to think about how am I gonna structure this? And what's the take home message? So it's not just you're, you're, you're talking, talking, talking and all over the place. It's gotta be some sort of structure um, and, and really emphasizing to them what makes a good story. Obviously you need a protagonist, you need some sort of predicament, right? And responses, you know, and how that protagonist uh, responds in certain situations. So no, that is a great, great question and, and comment. So I hope that helps. Yes, yes, thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much for your help. Thank you. Any other comments and questions? Well, thank you so much and good afternoon and, and happy holidays. And uh, I hope everyone takes care. Thank you so much. We were so grateful to have you talk today. Um, thank you. All right, thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.